today we're in the historic Welsh town of Conway. We've just seen the walls there, this the town walls, which were built in 1272 by Edward I, the hammer of the Scots. Before he took on the Scots, he took on the Welsh and he built these fortifications around one of his castles that we're going to visit today at Conway. It's an amazing place, Conway. It's like it's, it's frozen in history. It's a UN World Heritage Site and um, it's one of the finest examples of a walled town left in England, Wales, sorry, left in Wales, left in Britain. We're going to enter the historic Welsh town of Conway now, we're on the North Wales coast and we're going to go onto the city walls and make our way to the castle. How big do you think these walls are? That's at least four foot thick. This is serious defense here. I mean, this, these were built before the age of the cannon. So they were built to withstand any attack by sort of um, Welsh, Welsh insurgents. This is one of the four gates which um, are in the wall to allow entrance into Conway. You can see in this row here of um, lovely Welsh terrace there. These are ancient terraces built in the 18th and 17th century. And um, this, is a, this is a really old town, Conway, really preserved. We're in Lancaster Square at the heart of Conway. This square was named after Henry Tudor, the Duke of Lancaster, who won the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 and became the first Welsh monarch of England. Um, also in this square is the statue of Cwellan the Great. He founded Conway in, um, in the 11th century. He set up an abbey here, the Abba Conway Abbey, which was demolished by Edward I and it became the site of his castle. But uh, Cwellan the Great was the last real... He wasn't a king, he was a prince of Wales. Wales is a principality, it's not a kingdom. He was the, the last of the great Welsh kings, uh, princes. And it was going to be his grandson, Cwellan Ap Griffith, Gruffith. I mean, I struggle with these Welsh names who was to lead the rebellion in North Wales, which brought Edward I to this town and, and led, led to its creation. But uh, yeah, this is the heart of Conway, Lancaster Square. The great martial figure, Llewellyn the Great, holding his sword and his shield. The shield just depicts the four lions. He was a marshal prince and he subdued the other Welsh princes and became overlord of the whole of Wales. It became so important that when the Magna Carta signed, he, his signature was on that charter. He was equal to the Norman barons, the marcher lords of uh, South Wales and um, he established his dynasty as the, the ruling dynasty in this area of Gwynedd and Clwyd and then down into Difford. So we're going back into ancient Welsh history here and it's great to see a statue, you know, just uh, recognising his importance. This is the famous Plas Mawr. Plas Mawr, I'm, I'm practising my Welsh today. Merchant House, Elizabethan merchant, dating from around the 1570s. I mean, the wonderful thing about Conway is every street is full of history and, and romance. It's such a, a pleasant place to come and visit. It's so picturesque and it's preserved in time. And this is probably the finest of all the houses in Conway. It's quite an extensive house. If you go to the rear of this building, you'll see how large it actually is. So there's considerable amount of wealth of Conway in the 16th century. They were exporting wool products and fish 
and it was uh, also an entree point into the uh, River Conway in the hinterland of Wales. So it was a busy port at that time. Um, Aber Conway it was originally known as, which means the mouth of the River Conway. So this is the gate in the wall to the marina which we now go and visit the famous bay, Col uh, Conway Bay. The sense of history here in Conway is just incredible. We've just seen two of the round towers from the castle, which was built between 1272 and 1278 by Edward I. There are eight round towers to that castle and also two barbican set barbican towers over the gates which we'll visit surely but as we came along berry street we've seen this beautiful tudor ancient tudor house here abba conway house and uh, still in great condition and, um, yeah let's go and explore more of this historic town If you look here on our right, you can see two lumps, they call it the Camelback. That's where the original Welsh castle was based, on Abba Conway, on the, the, um, the harbour of Conway. Edward I, when he conquered this area, demolished that castle and built his own castle on the site of the former Abba Conway Abbey. And he moved the abbey down the um, Conway River to Mainan, Mainan Abbey, where I actually, my family had a caravan site, caravan on that site for decades, so it's all very familiar territory to me. This was an amazing place to come when you were a child, just a sense of wonder here, you know, it's a fantasy landscape, you can see the rolling hills, the historic walls, the limestone walls that Edward built and the fantastic castle which was a dream castle to a child and you'd arrive here at Conway and wonder what's all this about you know the castle that dramatic in a little Welsh town and we're going to explore that later why that castle is actually here he's just seen the map of Conway and you can see how intact the walls are these are the most intact walls in the uh, in Great Britain and there's about just over a mile of walls around the town leading to the castle with the historic town within the walls so it's quite a unique landscape here We're actually on the walls of uh, Conway now. Amazingly solid, these fortifications. They've lasted, what, 750 years already and they've probably got another thousand years left in them. So uh, you, you walk in the footsteps of history here. Now, Edward came here initially in the 1270s to, to, to uh, suppress a rebellion by Cuellen ap Griffith, uh, who refused to pay homage to him, which was compulsory in a medieval period to bow the knee to the king. Uh, but um, Cuellen's brother had rebelled against him and sided with uh, Edward. And uh, in, in retaliation, Cuellen did not bow the knee to him. So Edward came here with his army. Now, taking on Edward was quite a foolish thing to do because not only had Edward famously won the Battle of Evesham in 1265 when he defeated Simon de Montfort, he'd also killed Simon de Montfort and brutally butchered him. So uh, he, he was a man who could be quite ruthless when necessary. 
After the Battle of Isham, he'd established the throne of his father, Henry VIII III. He went off on a crusade. He was the leader of the ninth and final crusade to the Holy Land in 1268. He fought in North Africa, in Tunis, and then he went on to fight at Accra in the Holy Land. Jerusalem had already been lost, but Edward was determined to keep the Christian kingdom alive in the Holy Land. He um, was a very uh, committed crusader. He took the cross and he, 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 he fought hard in the Holy Land against the Saracens, the Muslim Arabs, and uh, kept them at bay. Now, on his way back from the crusade, his father died, Henry III, so he was going to assume the throne of the King of England. So he, he, he hired a, an architect, Master James of St. George, who'd been responsible for some of the Crusader castles in the Holy Land, and also the fortification of the town of Accra. He brought him here to North Wales. Now, after he defeated Clewellyn, Clewellyn uh, bowed the knee to Henry, uh, to Edward, but then rose up in rebellion again in 1282. And this time, Edward was determined to put him right in his place. So he came here. Uh, Clewellyn tried to rally the whole Welsh against Edward. And he, he went out of his kingdom in Gwynedd, his Princeton, and uh, went to uh, the centre of Wales to try and rally the forces there. But uh, he was exposed and he was vulnerable. And the Norman knights uh, ambushed him and killed him. And so Edward took the title of the Prince of Wales and gave it to his son, his newborn son. He brought his wife Elna here to North Wales, who was heavily pregnant. And he lifted up his newborn son famously in Carnarfon Castle along the coast, 25 miles along the coast, and said to the Welsh people, this is your new Prince of Wales. He doesn't speak a word of English, so you must accept him. And, we're so, and ever since, the eldest son of the monarch has been um, ordained as the Prince of Wales, including Prince Charles himself. Um, so, Edward established himself here and built these fortifications to secure his foothold. Hi, I'm with another American visitor here. Marcus has come all the way from South Dakota. That's it's right, a long trip. South Dakota, by Mount wow. Rushmore. Uh, this, how many Welsh castles have you seen so far? Uh, we've seen three. Seen three. You've seen Harlech. Harlech. Men of Harlech, men of glory. You've seen Carnarfon. Right. That's like the 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 Alpha Castle. Right. That's the brilliant. And, what, and you've seen Conway as well. Right. Which yep. is your favourite of those three? I would say uh, Carnarfon. Yeah, do you know in Carnarfon they had big ceremonies there? That's where the Prince of Wales would be. Right. You know, 69, uh, right? They did the. Well, uh, Prince Charles, yeah, but oh, Edward oh. I was the first to do it. He did okay. it with his son, who became Edward II. And it's gone on continuously since then. All the uh, sons of the monarch, the eldest son, would be made the Prince of Wales. Right. It's of course, stunning. the real Prince of Wales was Prince Llewellyn, who uh, Edward defeated in battle and killed. So uh, the Welsh aren't too happy about this. <laughs> but. Um, so, what do you think of this landscape, of North oh, Wales? It's, it's absolutely stunning. It's astonishing, it, it's, isn't it? It, it is, and uh, it's funny. Uh, in the Black Hills, yeah, uh, we have slate as well, and uh, yeah. a lot of mining uh, by Deadwood, and uh, it's very similar. I've similar landscape, but this. way more green. You guys have it. Never yeah. stops raining. Ah, oh, this is a wet landscape. It's, uh, here. it's pretty moist, so uh, we're glad to see some sun and. Uh, it's amazing the the energy of all these castles though. Stunning like four well, years on that one. Yeah, that took five years to build So he threw that up pretty quickly for such a major way But uh, what's what's in When he built these castles, he built 20 right across Wales and they cost a fortune I mean this castle alone cost 15,000 pounds Which you know in today's money is no big deal But if, if we compared it to today it would probably be over a hundred million pounds, right? Which is around 200 million dollars, you know it was serious money. It was stunning to read that uh, like that was one of the few that was actually to completion because he kind of ran out of some money on uh, Carnarvon. Well, maybe. you know, yeah, it was difficult to get. He had to press the workers from England. It was forced labour. They brought them across, and uh, he had to get the Welsh to dig the, the stone for them. It was a big operation, you know. He needed to really uh, push the boat out to, to make this happen. What's your favourite? I like this Conway Castle. 
it's really rugged it's it's a martial castle he was showing off a bit of Carnarvon he copied he'd been to Constantinople on the Ninth Crusade he was a crusader king and he, he wanted to replicate the walls of Constantinople in Carnarvon Castle uh -huh. so you'll see lines of red sandstone in it it's a bit of it and the hexagonal the towers whereas they're rounded this was built purely as a military base although he did live there as well but um, shortly after it was built he returned to London and the Welsh rebelled again, Prince Maddock, and wrecked his castle. He had to come and rebuild it. <laughs> it's yeah, old. it's stunning to see uh, this one, of, of all of them, that you yeah. still have the old the brickwork all around protecting the town, you know. Well, that's it. it. The town is still in, pl in place, you know, the town walls. What was the town walls like in Carnarvon? I didn't even see it. See, any. I think they might have gone, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's no... Versus this is more proper, right? Where they put it yeah. around the town to protect the town. and. Um, yeah, and the walls here are way thicker than uh, Canarfor, and I, I feel like these Solid are walls. a couple feet thicker, maybe. I think he had a and lot of trouble in this neck of the woods, and he had to make sure he was strong, you know. Although but, he only lived here, what, like uh, that one winter? Is that right? Probably, then, yeah. He like was, 700 he was always, years gone? He wanted to get back to the Holy Land and fight the, another crusade, the 10th crusade, but uh, by the time he got round to it, he'd actually the Crusader Kingdom had been destroyed by the Saracens. Oh, wow. But this is this was a recreation of the Crusader Kingdom because this is how when the Crusaders went to the Holy Land they were being built castles, fortified defences, and then walled towns for the Christians to live in because they were mm. facing the attacks from the Muslim Arabs and Saracens. Sure. So he just took that model from the Holy Land and replicated it here. Huh. You know, but it cost him a few quid. It's fascinating. <laughs> so this this is a dream. He, this is this in a sense was Edward the First own dream landscape. Because I don't think it was actually required. He was only subduing a few Welsh tribes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to show off. And they were happy about that. He wanted to show off. And right. I, I thank God the Americans are still impressed by it. That's what we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, cheers, Marcus. Cheers. Thanks for that. Cheers. Take care. See ya. <laughs> We've come off the Conway walls now and we've come past this row of fishermen's cottages, very quaint fishermen's cottages. And at the end of the fishermen's cottages, next to one of the round towers of the wall, is a house which is depicted as the smallest house in Great Britain. Now you might think that's a, a little gimmick, but in fact it was a really was inhabited. And the council had to tell the last resident that it was unfit for habitation, it's so small. I mean, it's literally four to five foot across. So, it'd uh, be pretty difficult to relax in that place, I think. It's so well conserved here in the centre of Conway. You can see this house here, 1582, but apparently it's actually older than that. So the local historians tell me. It dates back to the 14th century. Uh, it's wonderfully conserved. You can see how small the door is. I mean, literally, that's a five-foot door. So he come back into the uh, early medieval period there. The next door, of course, is the Glock Lass, the Blue Bell. I love the way everything is bilingual in Conway. I mean, Welsh is still, you can still hear Welsh regularly on the streets, and it's great to hear that. I mean, the Welsh language goes back at least 4,000 years. So it's an important part of our heritage in the British Isles. You know, and we need to have a sense, as I always say, of the depths of our roots. We, the Britons, have been in these islands for 10,000 years. They belong to us, we've cultivated them, we've developed them, and we've secured them. And um, we see today that it's everything is in a rapidly changing. You come to Conway and you appreciate the antiquity of Britain. You go into our big urban centres, the, the London, the Birmingham's, the Manchester's. Britain is being rapidly lost. It's a real tragedy. This is the church of St. Mary's and All Saints. It's an ancient church, the heart of Conway. It actually goes back to the 12th century, founded by the Normans, uh, an ancient Catholic church, um, which of course now is Church of Wales or Church in Wales. What is significant about this church 
is the cemetery attached to it. Amongst these graves are the graves of many of the old Welsh princes and lords. And this is where they would come for their burial. So, um, really historic site here. We'll go and have a closer look at this church. I love being here in this ancient place. Great sense of antiquity. You just look at that tower, I mean it's 800 years old. Uh, you can see by the irregular stonework, just one piece of limestone locked into another. And yet it works. It stood for this length of time. Incredible sight. Of course the clock at the top and at the bottom is the entrance and you can see the ancient timbers there everything is centuries old there's a great reverence here people have worshipped at this site they've worshipped the Lord in different forms obviously it was originally a Catholic church and then it became Anglican in tradition um, but um, this church is sacred to the Welsh people because many of the memories of Wales itself are encapsulated here. Um, not only were princes and lords buried in the cemetery, but there were many sort of rituals inside the church through the centuries to um, sanctify the Welsh people and draw the Welsh people to God and draw God to the Welsh people. So it's a very special place. There's a sense, deep sense of reverence here. I love coming to these ancient churches at the heart of the villages of Britain. They seem to represent a timelessness, which is in many ways our true root, that we belong to an ancient people. And we go back into the midst of times, into primordial, the primordial age, you know. Nah, this 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 is the mystery, the mystery of these islands, and it's encapsulated in this church of Saint Mary and All Saints. Fluttering over Conway, you'll find two flags. This yellow cross on a black background is the flag of Saint Dewi, Saint David, the patron saint of Wales. So, in a sense, that's the true Welsh national flag. We come over here. You can see it there, the Welsh dragon, porting this flag is wrapped around the, the flagpole. But the Welsh dragon is actually the battle flag of Henry Tudor. The green and white represents the Tudor family. The Welsh dragon is the ancient symbol of Wales. And this is the flag that was flown at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, when Henry Tudor became the King of England, the first Welsh King of England since Arthur so that flag is, is much more common in Wales and it's much more popular what a statement this castle was you know what well, still is really I mean Edward built it as a manifestation of his power he was telling the Welsh people that I've come here and I'm not going to leave um, and I'm not going to be overthrown you can feel when you get close to the castle you can feel its strength I mean, look at the size of these round towers. Eight really powerful round towers. Smaller curtain wall around it with smaller towers on. And then the barbican at the back, which we'll see, which again is towered. So he built a formidable structure here to say to the Welsh, I'm your king now, don't dare challenge me. The reason Edward I chose this location for the tower, uh, for the, the whole castle structure, was not only that it dominated the harbour but he could build it on a rock base I mean there's no foundations here except the rock itself and that was very significant because the main threat to medieval towers was not an attack over the walls it was the sappers digging under the castle and undermining its foundations by choosing a solid rock base it meant this castle was impregnable from underneath so any rebels had to storm the walls, and what a task that must have been. The C 
scenery is really dramatic here in Conway. You can see the bay, Conway Bay, and it's beautifully lush with green this time of year in June. We're looking out there towards Snowdonia in the east. You can see the beginnings of the Snowdon Mountains. That was Cruellen's heartland of Gwynedd. It's still in many, many ways the heartland of Wales. It's still incredibly Welsh. Um, so, yeah, Conway is located at the sort of bottom of this bowl. It's like a bowl shaped bowl area. It's an incredible location. It's, it's, it's like caught in a time warp. It's an ancient town. There's very few modern buildings, if any. And uh, this, every, every corner, every nook and cranny, there's a history and stories. And it's a wonderful place to just come and soak in the ancientness of our island. I love these arrow slits in the wall. I mean, they're very thin. And uh, if you're firing arrows at the enemy, you'd have... Uh, you were in little danger of being hit yourself. And uh, they, had a, they had a great angle, you could go round, rotate. I could imagine my ancestors on guard on these walls, waiting with the arrows for any raiders. That's another one bites the dust. Whoa! Well, summer's finally arrived in old England. We're out and about in Britain, ancient Britain, looking at some of our past glories and the history of these islands, our heritage. It's so important that we appreciate what we have in this, in this island. I repeat again, we need to defend it. But there's people who've come amongst us in their millions, immigrants, who don't really connect with this, these roots, don't connect with the history of our island. They have their, they have their own histories, but we value what we've got here. And it's great to share it with people from around the globe who are watching this. Uh, we'll be making more as the weeks unfold. We've got a few plans. So if you'd like to uh, follow us on our history tours, subscribe to our channel. Press the notification bell so you get noted. We're going to make be making videos regularly now, uh, historic videos. And of course, these are quite expensive to make. You know, we're traveling around the country. So if you'd like to make a contribution towards their cost, there is a PayPal link in the description. Feel free. Thank you.